This week we're going to be looking at Fighting Dirty with Sabre, um, Scabbard, Kicking, um, no biting or gouging though, so yeah. <laughs> these are all techniques that are perfectly legal in a lot of combat sports, but you know, like I guess by the standards of the period where, you know, there's a huge segregation of, um, you know, this, you know, this martial art teaches this very specific thing, like fencing teaches your use of sword, um, and like grappling as a whole is kind of rare. Um, you know, and then there's like boxing and then there's kickboxing, like, and then all like savart in the case of France and then, you know, wrestling, um, where, you know, there's a bit of overlap, but not as much that like they're very much, very strongly moving towards delineation um, and actually halt, you know, which is a trend that really continued up until the 1990s um, in Western Europe, Western Europe and North America, like it's obviously different in other places. Uh, but yeah, like, this is kind of, these are at the very least unorthodox tactics and talking about, talking about them as um, fighting dirty, I guess just makes them sound cooler. Uh, so. For those who don't know, I'm Tim. I'm uh, an instructory type person here at the Old Sword Club. Uh, yeah, do in-person lessons, which I'll hopefully be doing again soon um, as COVID declines. But for now, I'm doing been doing weekly uh, live streams until I can get uh, get physical classes up and running. Anyway, um, the manual working from tonight is uh, by Ganam Chambon. Um, there's links to it in the video description and also in the event description if you're viewing this on Facebook. Um, well, well worth looking, um, or well looking at the actual manual. Tonight we're going to be dealing with just the basics, like the basics of weapon handling, the basics of, you know, just operating the, the object, as it were. Um, so this will mostly be kind of talky, but, um, yeah, definitely if you can follow along, it'll be, um, quite good too. Um, so I'm just going to add my, my weapon simulator things. All right, so I'm just gonna be using a stick to represent the scabbard, mostly because I just don't have an actual scabbard. Um, but, you know, um, historically this would have been a steel scabbard. It would have had a steel cabinet at one end, uh, basically to make sure that it sat properly, uh, which also makes it a really, really good club. And there are descriptions or accounts of people using their set, set the scabbard as a club uh, from well before this period. Um, Chambon himself was writing really, this, like was, this man was published in 1911, so quite close to World War One. Um, it's very much, you know, in the age where there's not, people aren't really sure what cavalry will be doing here, um, here on out. I mean, certainly moved towards treating cavalry as uh, light infantry, light infantry, sorry, uh, where they, you know, um, they're basically mo using the horse for mobility, but they're still fire, um, still expected to dismount or at the very least sort of, um, you know, fire in lines like, um, regular infantry. The only recovery charge is sort of falling out of favour. But again, this is, you know, early 20th century, no one really knows what warfare is going to be. Um, and in probably like three short years after this manual was published, they would find it out in a horrifying fashion. Um, cool. So, um, to start off with, um, let's actually have a look at the grip and how you want it to hold um, both the saber and also the scabbard. So say I'll just move in. Um, with the saber, you hold it in essentially conventional saber grip. So all I do is I run my thumb down the back of the handle here. I pinch along the opposite side, like the front edge of the handle with probably the this bit. Um, like the sort of the middle knuckle or middle pad-ish um, off my first finger to basically push the front bit of the, to push um, the handle up into my thumb so it's secured. And I take the pad of my pointy finger and I use that to push the, um, push the handle of the sword, the saber into the palm of my hand. So I'm securing it on all sides. I then with my uh, root finger do exactly the same things with my pointy finger. And my bottom two fingers just sit gently on the saber um, you know, waiting to kind of come into effect. And one of the first things you do to give yourself impetus when you attack is you basically tense your little finger and ring finger um, as a way of sort of firing the saber forward. And I, I find that as a cue also means that you move your hand first, so you're moving everything in the right order. 
What I suggest you do now, if you're following along at home or if um, you're watching this later and just want watching this later and learn stuff, is bounce the saber in your hand like this, just bounce it back and forth. Um, basically, and what this will do is this will um, basically cause you to naturally adjust how you're gripping the saber to um, secure it. You're basically giving yourself enough resistance that you can adapt to so that you can adapt to um, getting the saber to work. Um, and this is this is quite helpful because it means, um, all this, and this means that um, you'll adjust so that it's, the saber fits your grip. So obviously, the way you're going to grip a saber is different to the way I will grip a saber, unless you have exactly the same hands as me, which no one does. So everyone's a little bit different in this regard. Next, we're going to have a look at our scabbard, or in my case, stick. Um, now, Chabon doesn't actually say how to grip um, the scabbard. He's not. <laughs> He's not terribly clear about that, but I'm kind of extrapolating from our manuals. Uh, something that's very, very important with this that I didn't really cover at the start. Um, Chambon as a manual is very, very much one of those, this seems to be a thing that a lot of French sources from this period, uh, one of those manuals where you kind of expect to already be familiar with a bunch of things. Like, you know, in his case, I think he expects you to be familiar with saber fencing generally before you dive in, which does I, I will admit does pose a bit of a problem for me in terms of my interpretation work because I have a, like I have a bit of a I have a familiarity with French saber but I'm not an expert in it in the same way that um, I may be very knowledgeable about 19th century British saber and because my first port of call for saber is always going to be from you know the other side of the channel some of the thing the ways I approach this might be different um, to like you know authentic kind of what was Chambon intending. Uh, but at the same time, my approach to humor generally is built off um, social context and the context of the audience of a manual. And I think there is a difference between authorial intent, like what the author of the manual and the people that are most directly teaching, um, how they would have approached it, how they would have interpreted it in period, and how someone who is maybe a bit removed, someone who is reading the manual, is interpreting it. And I think that's a really, really important distinction when we come to interpret when we do interpretation work in HEMA, because there's not a uniform interpretation. As much as I think there are things that are wrong, um, it's not that there, you know, there is still multiple right approaches depending on context. And so I think it's very important to be open that I am more familiar with British fencing, British saber than I am with French saber. Um, and you know. Um, but also at the same time, you know, generally kind of familiar with French foil, generally a bit familiar with French cane, uh, like cane fighting, have a bit of exposure to the bar, but not a lot. Um, and so that's kind of where I'm coming from with this. Um, and obviously if you think I get something wrong or if you think that I misinterpret something, do say in the comments, like this is meant to be a discourse. You know, don't, don't automatically see me as an authority that can't be challenged because that's really dumb. <laughs> like. I mean, I'm not saying I'm any more challengeable than any other authority figure, but I'm definitely saying I'm very, very challengeable. You can be like, hey, I think you're wrong for these reasons, and I'll do my best to take into account. Um, you know. Anyway, enough sort of distractions of historiography, which I will talk about online if given half the opportunity. Um, with gripping the scabbard, the thing I find works best is what you term a heavy grip. So in British fencing, there are two grips, the light grip, which is what we saw for the saber, and the heavy grip. For the heavy grip, what I do is I run the stick down the palm of my hand. So it's basically sitting in the heel of the palm here, which is the strongest part of the hand. I then take my thumb and wrap it around and basically squeeze, uh, use the pad of my thumb to squeeze the, um, the stick into this part of my palm, palm of my hand, so that it's secured on both sides. I then take my pointy finger and, you, and wrap that around to um, squeeze the stick from the other side. So I'm securing the stick on all four sides with a different part of my hand. I then take my root finger, do the same thing as I do with my pointy finger just to make it extra strong. And I also use both of these fingers, the pads of these fingers to give a bit of extra support to pushing the stick into the palm of my hand. I then just rest my bottom two fingers on it. Um, again, with the saber, as with the saber, the, bo the bottom two fingers are to give impetus for the strike. They don't actually secure the weapon. The weapon is secured by the top two fingers and the thumb, and then given force by the bottom two fingers. Um, 
and then of course bounce the stick in my hand like I did with the saber, um, basically to give me some resistance and force me to make any adjustments to hold onto it. And what you'll find is doing this, you will naturally adjust to what is biomechanically strongest for you. Um, basically as just a trick with humans, if you're thinking of becoming an instructor or even just wanting to better understand your own learning, humans um, approach most things through the lens of problem solving. So how do I hit the other person? How do I hit this, my opponent? Is a problem to be solved. How do I do a cut without, get, uh, cut without getting stabbed in the face? Is a problem to be solved. Um, and so yeah, like when you're, um, and the reason why we can't just go out and intuitively do everything is that some problems are just too hard for us initially and we have to work up to them by solving easy and easy problems. And with sword fighting, that's very much true is we can't just go out and sword, like, you know, sword fight effectively, we need to, we need to learn um, because the problem is too big, but we can break it down into smaller problems that can be solved um, by making little adjustments for us. And this is kind of why I'm like, yeah, how are you going to do this a little different to me just by default? Right, okay, so that's how to hold both of the weapons. Now let's look at the guard. So start off with, just going to start with our feet. Start with, um, the stance this is a pretty standard 19th century stance for weapons. If you've been watching these for any given period of time, you'll have seen me explain this a lot. Um, but if not, because I know we always, there's always like one or two people who are new and there's always the prospect of someone who's never like never seen any of my videos before uh, watching this down the track. Um, standard stance is I start with my feet my, with an L, my sword side foot or my saber side foot is in front of my um, scabbard side foot. So like that. And then what I do is I move my sword side foot directly forward. And I don't know if you can see, if you're not a large enough screen, you can probably see this. My foot is actually on the same, is on completely on a single floorboard. Um, my feet are very, very narrow. And I want that, I want to stay narrow, I want to keep everything line because that will give me a center line for fight. Or more than like if I extend my arm out straight with it directly above that line, this is now the center line for the fight. This isn't like, even with the additional weapon, even with the, the cane or scabbard, um, if I call it a cane, it's because I'm actually physically holding a stick, um, but it's meant to represent scabbard, and I will confuse myself. Anyway, if I hold my hand directly out, this is the center line of the fight, and even having an offhand weapon doesn't change that. It's not like, um, say, boxing, where the center line is the center of your body. The center line for this is your arm expanded directly out, um, which means there is more meat or more of you on one side than the other. So this is asymmetric, and that's just that's just the way this rolls. Um, but what I do with my feet is I extend them out to be two foot widths apart, or two, like, and when I say foot widths, I mean my feet don't, not like the old imperial measurement. And I bend my knees so I've got a comfortable seat. I'm comfortably sitting um, and can kind of move comfortably without having to bob up and down. So you notice that the head is not moving up and down terribly much. And I can tell because I can see the row of blinds behind me. Um, yeah, this is a thing to work on if you're at home. Videotape yourself just moving back and forward in your stands, like taking little steps back and forward, and see if you're bobbing up and down. Um, or even like if you've got like a full length mirror. Um, I recommend looking side on just because front on, because you're moving you're moving forward and back, perspective is going to mess with you. Um, but that's a really really good exercise to do to get to really smooth footwork. The reason you don't want to bob up and down has nothing, you know, um, has everything to do with agility of movement. So when I can make these sorts of, when I can make, keep my legs bent to make steps, my steps are very, very quick and very controlled. I can, you know, bail out if I need to or change direction really quickly. If on the other hand, I'm upright, I make bigger committed movements that are one, very much much more coffee, so you can see me rocking back and forth. But for two, I'm kind of falling and in free fall. Um, and it's like something I see a lot is something I used to do, so I really made a lot of effort to work my footwork, is people will stand quite upright, they'll lunge by falling and then retract by basically bouncing, and we'll do this, which in order to not be a very, very big, very predictable movement, you, means that you're restricted to very, very short lunges. 
it also will overwork your right leg, which means you'll get horrible muscle imbalances, which is something I'm actually, I'm still like dealing with. Um, but yeah, so you want to keep your knees bent comfortably and I mean, how low you need to sit really depends on you. Um, I have quite a high stance, all things considered. This is actually quite, you know, this is about as high as one can sit in a stance without causing problems. Some people have very, very low stances. Um, but yeah, you're going to do, just do what works for you. Um, the, the, when I say do what works for you, don't. I don't mean do what comes naturally, because what comes naturally is probably not good sword fighting. Do what achieves the goal of smooth, rapid movement. Um, and one of your ways of testing that is to see how much your head is bobbing up and down, how much extraneous body movement you have, which you want to keep coming up. All right, let's now look at what we do with the sword. So the sword, or saber, is held in the tears hand position. So my hand is held at 45 degrees along this way um, and in line with the saber side of my body. Um, probably actually just a little bit outside, so my thumb is in line with the edge of my body. In this case, uh, unlike a regular tear scar where the forearm is whole is held horizontal, this I actually retract, I bring it up, um, and my tip goes up with it. So if I start here in normal tear scar, this is a very standard garden period, uh, really on both sides of the channel, but actually something I found really curious is that the French are doing this more and more, um, and actually through most of the through the 19th century, uh, there's a move towards more, not retracted guard in the sense of like a new kind of, I'm holding myself all the way back here, but um, kind of withdrawn guards, um, where you know, my elbow, is, my elbow is bent at 90 degrees. Uh, but in the case of this, I'm actually raising everything up. Manual does show this, which means my tip is now very, very high. I'm not, I'm gonna have to bring it down to bring on my thrust. Um, and my hand is actually in line with my shoulder. Um, so this is very, very, like this is almost a, like a fully retracted kind of medieval guard. Um, the reason why I'm doing this, why I'm taking basically a normal tear scar to bring it up, is so I've got the scabbard and I need to keep, um, this, keep the sword out of the way of the scabbard. I don't want a situation where moving one causes a tangle. Uh, and so what I do with the scabbard to achieve the same thing is I put my arm, my hand basically on my hip, so my, my hip is here, um, like top of my hip bone. Um, so my actual hip is a bit lower, but the top of my like my pelvic, you know, my pelvic bone is about here, which is where I want the stick. And I rest across my body like this, so that it's actually sitting quite low and it's quite withdrawn. This is very much a you know retracted guard held against the body um, to fire out. But I'm basically keeping it out of the way so I can do stuff with my sword. Because um, when you're doing, when you're fighting with two long weapons, one of the biggest risks is that things will tangle and get stuck. So, this is the guard. This is where I held my weapons. Um, the reason, um, obviously, there are problems with this guard. I think, um, you know, like, obviously, if you see something you think is a problem, do say. Uh, because it might be that something is deliberately suboptimal in one regard because it needs to compensate for another. Uh, but something a lot of people pick up with this is, is that I normally say don't bend your arm less than 90 degrees because it's biomechanically weak. And this is biomechanically weak. I have doubted with it with people who have done lessons with me who know that I say that and have taken advantage of the fact that that is a problem. Um, you know, if I get any force hitting here, hitting on the intersection here, it's going to bend my arm and just basically cave my parry in unless I put a lot of muscle into holding it off, holding it back in which case um, I'm going to exhaust myself, so neither good. It's not structurally sound for parry, and this isn't intended, and you don't parry from this position. This isn't like regular sabre where the difference between a parry and a guard is a parry as the tip is higher, a guard, whereas in a guard it's pointing the opponent to boop them. Um, but this, the idea with this is I'm keeping everything retracted so I can fire it out. Um, with a lot of force and fury and aggression. This is something Chen Long says, is that you want to come out very rapidly and aggressively with your attacks. And he kind of implies that um, because this is, you know, done in a sort of battlefield situation, um, you know, this is done in kind of a battlefieldish situation, um, you're going to want to attack much, much more aggressively than you would in the cell. And you attack, a direct attack has a much, much higher chance of success than it would 
in like a duel or um, you know in a fencing cell or like recreational fencing. Um, but yeah, so that's I think interesting. A lot of something that I've tested hasn't yet. Um, all right. Scouted for, I think the scouted position, you know, doesn't, you know, is retracted. I can't stick my hand out. I can't do, you know, if I extend my hand like this, on the fact that I'm likely to pull the tangle, it also means my hand being unprotected by a shell is the target. So I keep really, I need to keep this back and fire it out as well, you know, when it comes in handy or when the situation arrives. Right, in the water. And so if you have any comments or questions again, chuck them down. Um, yeah. I'm more than happy to more than happy to stop for, com for questions. Also, I have a larger screen now for these, so I can actually see your questions. Mostly see your questions from here. Um, or at least I'll be able to get my glasses fixed. All right. So now let's look at the first type of attack that one of the first, well, one, the first attack we'll get tonight, um, which is thrusts. Tim Bolton says that the thrust is, in general, more effective. He says it's quicker, um, and he says that the saber is better suited to it. Um, the sabers that he would have been using at the time would have, had a very, would have actually been very would have been designed around thrusting more so. Like they would have had very very thin narrow tips, uh, more like a rapier or um, you know thrusting sort like the more sort of thrust centric medieval swords as opposed to a cutting saber, which tends to have a broader tip, um, broader than these. Um, according to Van Easton, uh, the amount of force a sword will hit with um, is, amongst other things, influenced by how much metal there is at the tip. So cutting swords tend to have wider tips or broader tips than uh, thrusting swords. Um, I mean, with simulators, this is true with blunt fencing swords. If you get ones that are a sharp fencing sword, but blunt, but like with a you know a two millimeter, one millimeter, two millimeter edge. Uh, there are some versions, particularly things like um, blunt fencing versions of the seventeen ninety six, like cavalry saber, which has a very very chunky tip, um, can still hit really really hard. Um, so I think Chambon is part of Chambon's comments comes from the type of weapon he's using. Whether he's aware of that or not, I don't know. But you know, it, this is this is his comment. Um, but for with thrusts, in order to thrust, um, what I need to do is bring my tip online. So I start up here, um, so my tip's not online. I can't bring it online in flight because when you do that, even if you can do that in a drill, sort of, it's with the variance, like the intense randomness of your own movement and also the intense randomness of your opponent's movement, it's very, very easy to end up slapping people when you try and thrust them um, doing that. So you need to bring your tip online first, and then thrust. Um, this movement is actually, this is not such a bad thing, because I find coming to the thrust position and then thrusting is a really, really cool kind of beat. Um, you know, I can start here and come to the position to thrust, and then thrust my way in um, as a way of displacing my opponent's weapon. So that does work, and that's kind of very the thing with Chambon and kind of his approach of, basically like do something to, or like expecting that you're only actually going to do one action um yeah every fight is going to be a single action and your action has to should that is you know needs to be the right one so there are two main thrusts or two thrusts you use pretty much thrust in tears and thrust in cart so like i said tears is when my hand is in this angle is in this 45 degrees at 45 degree angle and in line with the same side of my body. Sorry, tears. Um, and then cart is basically turn my hand over and right to the opposite side of my body. So my hand is at, my hand is at this angle here. Palm up this angle and in line with the non saber side of my body. Um, these are pretty much the two hand positions that <laughs> uses for nearly everything. Um, this is a very very simplistic system. Um, to thrust, um, to thrust in tears, all I do is I come down to basically bring my tip online, extend, kick, kick my leg out, roll onto my toes to come to a lunge, 
this is a very short lunge and Chambo is like you can't laugh. If you're expecting to fence on rocky ground or on like any kind of unstable footing, you can't lunge very fast. So don't try and do a big, the big sort of lunges you do in the cell. Just do a short aggressive lunge. And from here, I come back. To come back, I push off my front leg um, by roll, like lifting my toes up, so I'm pushing off. But also to retract, I'm bending my back knee. Um, and I'm pulling with my back knee to pull me back. And that back knee bend is really, really important. One, because it makes my retraction a lot faster. Two, it means I come back to a proper stance rather than bouncing high and ruining my stance. So, I pull back, and then once I come back, I retract the arm. I bring it back to, um, probably back to a regular guard position and then pull it back to guard. Um, and Chenon says you do this regardless of whether or not you're hit land, it says you should always come back to guard and expect an attack. Even if you hit the other person, expect they're going to have a go at a crack at you. So let's practice that a few times and get a few repetitions in. So first by numbers or progression. So point on line, extend, kick, lunge, retract. Point on line, extend, kick, lunge, retract. Point on line, extend, kick, lunge, retract. As much as I screwed that up, then the order is quite important because I need to get my weapon out. So if I come forward and then thrust, I'm basically giving my opponent a target to take advantage of right up until I, um, I launch my attack. And, you know, in that time, my opponent is probably going to react by countercutting, which means that I'm definitely going to get hit in exchange. And, even if I do hit them, I still get hit myself, which I don't like. And so once more for luck, point on line, extend, kick, lunge, retract. All right, so let's now try and do that as one kind of smooth movement, one kind of smooth motion. So I'm just going to call thrust, and I want you to do everything in the order we just did, proper order we extend first, um, but do it all in sort of all in one smooth progression, I guess. So, thrust. 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 And thrust. All right, now let's look at the thrust on the other side. So, what we do for this is, um, what we do for this is we go to the position of cart. So from here in the guard, I go to the cart position um, quite aggressively. So this is just turn my hand over and beat down, almost like I'm striking my opponent out of the way. Um, and you can theoretically use this as a defense. Um, and I do basically the same thing as I did before. So extend, kick, lunge, retract. So from the guard, let's actually do that a few repetitions. Uh, let's do it as a progression again, rather than doing it as a like as a step thing, because I want you to focus. But I want you to focus on moving to a different hand position this time and when you reposition. So from here, reposition, lunge, and lunge, lunge, lunge. And lunge. Alright, so those are the thrusts. Now let's look at the cuts. Um, so Chambong has two cuts, he does basically for everything, uh, which he describes as the cuts in tears and cut. Um, I find this really interesting because this, this is the only place I've seen anyone describe uh, saber cuts. In terms of hand position, of like the foil fencing hand positions, um, there's normally those hand positions are used to describe thrusts and also parries, uh, whereas cuts are described um, in the case of bridge fencing using a different numbering system, uh, using a much, well, a much older numbering system, um, although it would have been around for over 100 years by, um, you know, by the times of Hutton and stuff were writing about it. Um, or in the case of the French, they describe it in terms of targets. They'll have like, you know, cut to the inside of the arm, cut to the outside cheek, 
you know, cut to the inside of the thigh. Um, and so it's always described in terms of, uh, it's descriptive, it's described in terms of the target. Um, in, some, in some cases, you know, there are things like the bandolier cut, which is named because it goes along the lines of the bandoliers that soldiers would wear. Um, but yeah, it's, it's descriptive. Whereas Chambon is the first time I've seen anyone describe cuts in terms of hand position numbers, like tears and cut. Uh, but again, he has just tears and cut as his hand positions. Um, he says you can cut in multiple, you can cut in multiple different ways. So um, you've got obviously the, the direct kind of direct attacks or direct cuts, like from the guard position, I fire my hand out and come back to guard, or you know, I'm doing man cut, fire my hand out, come back to guard. So this is a very direct motion, and this kind of takes advantage of this retracted guard. When I fire, when I move my guard, well, even though this is biomechanically a very, very structurally weak position um, to start off with, it means that I've got a lot of I've got a lot of space and a lot of muscles to fire myself forward or go coiled. And what it also means is that you know I'm gaining basically gaining biomechanical strength as I come forward quite aggressively. So it's kind of this really accelerated aggressive cut, you know, is something the system really, really excels at. Um, so let's actually get some. Um, and these are done often on the lunge, um, unless they're repost. So when you do them, you basically, the idea is that you punch to the cut position, and when my hand gets to full extension, I want to then start bringing my body forward. So I want to try the, or a good cue in terms of if you're doing this correctly, is, um, is your hand consistently moving forward? Like you don't want a sort of a situation where I cut and then lunge because my hand is staying still for a moment there. What I want is my hand to be moving forward basically consistently um, so it never actually jolts, which is really, really hard to do when you're also concentrating and talking. So. Um, and then from there, the attacks are either very, you know, either in cut, so aggressive clean coming from cut, or punching out into tears and retracting. Um, these are very, very quick aggressive movements. Um, alternatively, your next option is to preface everything with a Moulinet. Um, Chen Bon does say that Moulinet is a useful movement. Um, he describes it as a combat, like he does describe it as a combative movement, uh, particularly for keeping multiple opponents at bay. Um, which is, but he makes a lot less use of it than a lot of other French sources I've seen. Um, most, most French say systems even into, well, definitely into late 19th century, although Chimbon is from, you know, the early 20th. Most French say systems, uh, every cut is done on Moulinet. Um, Moulinet just being a little windmill, so it's a rota full rotation of blade, moving the tip in a circle of some kind, uh, whereas Chimbon, he says they're useful and you should do them, um, and he says also they're a good thing to do to generate power, which you're going to need to do a lot because your saber is not as good at cutting as it is at thrusting, which again I think is just a result of the model saber he's using, but you know, you, you like, you know, you, you bake the cake, you've got the ingredients for, I don't, I don't know, I don't know, there's probably usefulness in there, there, I don't know. But for this motion, all I do is I rotate and come out. So, oh, there's two types of my sorry. There's horizontal, where I'm moving like this, and there's vertical, where I'm doing this. Um, horizontal are pretty useful because if you're fencing from engagement or if you've got there's an obstruction where your opponent's just stuck their sword out, um, particularly if you're in more conventional guard, you're going to cut over. And I find with 19th century British stuff where they don't do any, they don't preface with the Moulinet at all. You still end up doing a small horizontal Moulinet just to get around your opponent's sword, um, just to be able to get a line to attack. So with this, start off with, probably the way to drill this is just rotate your sword in the air, 
uh, both forward and backward. Unfortunately, I don't really have enough space to show you the tip of my sword, but I hope you get an idea of the different directions it's moving in. And then once it's made, come to the end of a rotation, you launch. So from here, I bring it all the way around, I launch and come back to guard. So I throw basically the same kind of snap cut um, kind of motion, but after I've described what a circle, or at the end really, I come around and rather, I come around and then just at the end of the circle, I come forward. So it's more like a question mark than a circle, which you get the idea. Same deal with the vertical lines. I will drop and throw a punt. I will mull at A and throw. Mull at A and throw. Mull at A and throw. Um, and you'll notice that I can do, I can throw the cut from on either side from the same mull at A. So if I go in front of my body, I can cut in cut or I can cut in tips. Same with the outside body. I can cut in cut, or I can cut in tips. Um, and the advantage of being able to switch between the two is really helpful, because if I've got an opponent, particularly if I've got an opponent that's a bit skittish, um, or you know, very fixated on where my sword is, I can cut. I can wool it out and cut in one plane, and then I can actually use that to faint and come on the other side. And when I do this, um, particularly if I was doing this as a one-off, if I'm working off the expectation that I've really only got one action that I'm going to make in engagement, I would very much do this as a feint, just to maximise my chances of landing. Uh, and will they also lend safety in terms of timing? Because my opponent has a very, very long my opponent's going to lash out or is going to try and counter cut it. They're going to have to try. They're not, or they're more likely to do it when I'm in the middle of in which case I am moving through a covered position than, if, um, than when I throw the feint, which is when I'm most vulnerable. Um, like my opponent would have to basically know that I'm going to throw a feint and be waiting for it to counter cut me because I'm covered by middle and also by distance right up until I get to extension when I throw the feint, which is the only point that I'm vulnerable to the counter cut, um, which is a very, very small point of time. Um, and also, you know, my opponent, if they're going to go, they're probably going to have gone by then, which in which case I've got the coverage of the line to, you know, basically defend and then flow straight through to the attack. Um, and one of the ways in which Belleville, who's a much earlier French author, uses the lanes, he uses them to cover himself as he comes in for the cut, which I've been playing with, and it's really, really cool. Um, so yeah, you can throw with horror or with vertical mornings, they're the slowest, but they've got the advantage of you know, deception and also the advantage of power generation. So if you are concerned about whether or not you're going to cut through your opponent, really good thing to do. And Chen Bon says basically you will use them for that purpose. Uh, so next up, I'm going to take a sip. We're going to look at the parry riposte. So, Chambon, unsurprisingly, has um, two parry riposte. And parry riposte is a really, really interesting thing from like a theory perspective because there are some fencing sources that seem to regard parry riposte as a single movement. You know, you do X with parry riposte. If you look at particularly like um, modern Olympic fencing, the tactics wheels. Parapost is a single, you know, it's a single mood, you know, is considered a single tempo. Uh, the same way that direct attack is a single tempo. Um, I can kind of see where they're coming from, where if you're parry repost, parapost, um, where it's a direct attack, a very fast direct attack, that kind of makes sense that you could consider it one tempo. Um, I think it's also important to remember that with ideas like tempo, you know, what constitutes a single action um, is kind of a bit arbitrary in that what we're doing is a continuum of movement. And sure, like, you know, doing a remiss where I cut and then throw another cut, 
you know, that's considered two tempo, um, because even though it's on the same lunge, it's also this, you know, the reason for that has really nothing to do with the time, or very little to do with the time it takes me, and everything to do with kind of the arbitrary line drawn and the continuum of movement. And that isn't to say that there are things that are obviously not one tempo or things that are very obviously one tempo, but just that the way we divide it up is a little bit, is a bit arbitrary, is a bit subjective. Um, and Chambon kind of seems to fall into a more rock, modern camp of treating Parapost like a single tempo, whereas previous authors like, say, Hutton would have treated it as two, you know, as two tempos. Parry tempo and Riposte tempo. Um, I think this is also part of, how, part of the product of how Chambon kind of approaches parrying and riposting, where for Chambon, parries are very, very percussive. So starting in the retracted guard, to parry, my hand goes to the same position it would in foil or um, sabre, like you know, just conventional sabre, not with the um, with a more conventional guard with a more little and with less offhand accoutrement and, dirt and uh, trickery. Um, the difference is it, to get there, it moves there from much further away, so it becomes much more percussive. And what Chen Bong says is that you should basically parry your opponent. Um, until you, you're you outside the line of your body. Um, and obviously, I'd be surprised if you, what he's saying is you should punch really wide because this is a bad way to parry. Like, this is very vulnerable to feints and very vulnerable to redoubles. Um, and also, it's very, very hard to then come back in a meaningful way from here. Whereas, I suspect what he says is that he wants you to parry, so you can see there's a little bit of a gap between my, certainly the hilt of my saber and my body. Not much one. But my cue actually is that I try and get my thumb to be in line. This so of my thumb, if I moved back to the line of my um, to my body, would be sitting, would be t just touching the outside. Um, so I know that I haven't overcommitted, but I've also gone far enough to not undercommit. And I think that's probably about where Tenmon expects you to be, um, because that means that I can then I displace my opponent to a nice big opening for a very very quick repost. So the motion for power, uh, so if I'm from this guard, parrying um, cart and then reposting, I basically, I strike down to a cart parry position. So my hand is the same in the cart position I've got before. My elbow is wider than 90 degrees. Um, and kind of is, you know, wider than 90 degrees is open. Um, my forearm is, well, for this one, basically vertical, but that does change depending on the height. Um, and my tip is relatively high, you know, my tip. My tip is not aligned for a thrust, my tip is high enough probably that my opponent can't come over. That is my car parry. And then from here, I snap forward with basically a very vertical cut. So if you're doing bridge fencing, cut number seven. If you're not, just straight down vertical cut. This is the only time Chambon doesn't do, really do a diagonal cut. So I parry. Repost. And it's bang bang. It's a very, very quick aggressive movement. I come to a position and fire forward. And same on the other side. I come to a position of tease parry. So I punch to basically my elbow is wide, is open more than 90 degrees. Um, my tip is still high, like higher, too high to thrust without repositioning. Um, stop my opponent from coming over, and my hand is in tears, so it's in, you know, 45 degrees in line with the outside edge of my body. Come to there, I snap forward with a vertical cut. This is very, very much, and this is a very, very quick, aggressive movement. So I can say that Chambon thinks this is one tempo, you should as well, with you're not thinking necessarily just um, move to one position and then to another, like you would in all the systems, you're thinking, you know, move to the full cut position, via the power position. I'm basically looking to strike down to smack my opponent's sword out of the way and keep going and cave their head in. So it's aggressive kind of power cost. Um, but because you know, you know, those parries will defend your high lines, um, and even not entirely, you do need to adjust the height sometime. Um, and Chambon, um, because he only really has the two parries, he just teaches you to get the most out of them. 
So if you want to, if you want to, um, you know, lower your parry, all you do is open your elbow more. So I can get all the way down to the low tiers by just opening my elbow. So I start with guard, as I punch out, I come really, really low. And this will protect. You can see on me that um, that will protect you like just above my knee. Um, I when I fence, say if I go really use um, rising cuts, like, like um, or like these kinds of you know, set team or seconders parries, because I have you know. I have a proportionally short torso, so I can pretty much cover all the way to my knee um, with just a TS or a car parry. And if someone does go lower, I'm going to want to slip and counter cut anyway. Uh, not the Chen Bon has either, the option Chen Bon I think just assumes that you're going to have to go for your legs in combat. Um, which I find really interesting that he's basically, he doesn't expect there to be leg divers because I find that. I mean, people uh, don't really know what they're doing, but they kind of, they're desperate to, you know, that's what they do is they'll die for legs. So, you know, I, I just, I, that is a very, to, my, to me, that's a very, very interesting conceit. Um, so again, if I want to lower, all I do is open my elbow more. And otherwise the motion is the same. If I'm going, say, say I'm defending with a low cart, in this position, just punch to here, and then cut. Um, if I need to, as I bounce up, I just retract my arm a little bit. I just keep my wrist um, in this position until it's higher than my target, and then hit it, and then hit out. It's not hugely different. You know, I strike down and then strike up. Um, just arc up with the shoulder and snap out. These are very very quick, snappy, aggressive cuts. Same thing on the other side, if I'm parrying tears, I just punch down and snap. Um, theoretically, you could use the scatter for a bit of a flick, but uh, yeah, that's not really something that I've really tried or something that I've missed or practiced. It seems a bit complicated. But just down and then up. Um, and very, very quick, very aggressive. Conversely, if I want to parry higher, what I do is I keep, I want to um, keep have my elbow open enough because otherwise my parry will collapse. And this, if you happen to me about two weeks ago, I got slapped with my parry and one of them actually did collapse because it was too retracted. Um, so if I need to defend high, I just punch out until my elbow is more than 90 degrees and bring my hand to whatever position my hands needs to be. So let's say I'm hammering in tears, so I'm keeping my hand in the same angle, just punch forward, just punch forward. Conversely, if I'm going for cart, punch forward. And I can keep this as high as I want. And basically, if you want to think of it another way, if you want to think about how you get to this position from a parrot position, imagine lifting from your shoulder. So if I'm, say, in a regular tears parry and I need to uh, raise it, I raise from my shoulder. I don't, you know, I don't want a contracted elbow because that one means my parry will collapse. And same deal on the other side. Just punch out until I've extended. And again, that's, you know, get some percussion into you. Um, cool. So, that is the parent repost. Um, one thing I've kind of noticed with this system is that it's a very, it is very, very aggressive. It's very, very, you know, hit as hard as fast, or hit as fast as you can. Um, and hit as directly as you can with Chambon. I mean, Chambon does outright say that he thinks that direct attacks have a reasonable chance of landing. Uh, he also says that off the counter repulse, which is where you attack, parry, and then repost, so you basically repost or repost, he says, this is a thing you see in the cell, but you never actually see it on the battlefield. He's like, um, like that's all he really says about it. Whether or not what he means is that no one, no one does it, or whether it's or whether it's not a good thing to do, it's not clear. Um, I'd be surprised if he doesn't think it's a good thing to do. Um, it's just yeah, he's um, but yeah, it, it's something he says you just don't see very very often. Um, and it's actually a thing that was happening in this period. Like you look at um, the few other like military fencing manuals from this period, 
they're all moving towards single action. You know, British cavalry side was notoriously basically moving towards um, trying to hit, just hit with a counter thrust. So you just you know, cover yourself with thrust and come in on the assumption that you never actually get more than one movement in an exchange. Um, although what I find very interesting, although Chambon is an, is a foot manual, it's a manual for fencing on foot primarily, foot. and he's pretty clearly primarily um, this is for officers, this is for infantry officers, this is not for dismounted cavalry, um, which I find really interesting because a lot of the mentality of the manual seems to be very very similar to the same mentality that was being applied to cavalry at the time. Um, one of the things I find which this gets more interesting is when he starts talking about the Moulinet as an attack in its own right, um, where he says, you, know, you will do things, like you will extend out, you just cut 45 degrees like this. Um, he says you do this when you're facing multiple opponents, so if you've got people around you, people getting aggressive, you just keep cutting and keep moving and repositioning to deter their attacks, and you basically keep doing that until you get like a really obvious opening, uh, which is not seen unlikely, or until help arrives. <laughs> um, but yeah, he says this is how you do terror attacks. And he says the mole is a good, um, particularly the, heart, the vertical one, is a good aggressive movement. Um, I've never tested it against multiple opponents. I might, actually, we are meeting up to fence on Saturday, so potentially we could do some scenario doubting where, um, you know, I can face multiple opponents with a saber and see how it goes. Um, yeah. Which could be interesting. Um, see, if, see if this works out. We should just you know, do some scenario testing, which would be fun. Um, but yeah, he does treat them all as an aggressive thing. The other application for this, I find, in, even just in regular kind of just staying cyber fencing, is if you've got someone who's got like good throng guards, they go like, you know, the high guard of the Hungarian um, sort of thing, or um, you know, sort of with wrong guard type things that you see in medieval systems when people have much higher roofs than me. I've been this section like two weeks as well, so, uh, so this could get interesting. Um, but even like, you know, stuff like this, or even low. Like I see a lot of people really struggle to do, understand what to do against if someone adopts a really low guard. What you can do is use them all day, and you just basically cut where their arms have, where their arm would go if they bring their sword directly forward. So if I'm here, my arm is going to get to here, it's going to get to about here. Um, if it comes directly forward. Either I'm going to have to reposition and then cut, which is a bit more predictable. So all you do is you mulinate to where that hand is going to have to go um, to cut it as it comes in. And I find this is a really, really good method of just deterring people, from, like basically pulling people out of a retracted guard um, because they will either change guards because they're worried about being counter cut or they will move, or they will swing and chop and cut into, basically cut straight into the middle lane, which in case you've got, you've got a clash, which means you've got an engagement. Um, at which point you want, at which point you want to attack this one, don't take the clash as an invitation to attack them. Um, the reason being is if our swords clash, so if I swing like this, and your sword came in and collided directly with it, we're in an even position, and neither of us, because we've clashed as well, neither of us really has um, any kind of momentum impetus. We don't have to, you know, overcome inertia again. So we're basically in, in neutral position. This is also the problem with, uh, and why I think you've seen moving away from these extended, very, very tight kind of parries and guards that you see um, at the end of the 18th century, is you parry your opponent, but it doesn't actually get you anything. Whereas here, if I'm in a retracted guard, my hand is for one, like, you know, my hand is, my hand is not directly back, because that would put it, my hand is over, um, and because also the angle of my blade, I've actually deflected my opponent, so I've created an opening. Um, but yeah, if you're, it's important to be aware of that dynamic when you're mourning against someone in a retracted guard, because you will clash, um, you'll be in an equal position, and then it's whoever is better at working from that clash. That clash will um, will win, and it does mean that people can do things like two consecutive attacks without a defensive action, and still hit you. Whereas if you're parrying, um, so what you want to do when you get that position off of all of those, and I'll just cut straight into it, is try and displace their sword, like push their sword down, 
I think it's crosshair and velvet, as uh, Chambon would call it. Um, you basically, you take your sword and you move it from one position to another um, as a way of basically displacing and creating an opening and also creating safety for yourself because that will usually basically smother the attack alike. Um, but I find that's just something I got from this manual. It isn't at all relevant to the context of the manual, but it is relevant to the context of Mon Hema. And something, I didn't really cover this at the start very much, um, so I kind of want to get into it, but something I think is very, with all of these workshops where I'm working with the manual, I'm not that familiar with. This is essentially live interpretation work. This is, you know, me um, going through my thoughts. And they, will pro they may or may not change. Uh, certainly if you have anything that you want to add, do just say so in the comments. All right, so let's move on and look at kicks. Um, so Shimon is usually not very specific about what, what kicks he thinks are good. He just says that you can do them. He tells you the times you can do them. Um, but he's not actually necessarily very specific. Um, there's, what I find, uh, so what I did is I had a look at the kicks that are common to French Savart, and then I tried each of them. Um, I looked, established a criteria by which um, they would be good or bad. Um, I also tried a bunch of kicks out in admittedly slow bouting where, you know, you've got the time to go, oh, this is, you know, you've got time to realize that this is a kick, that this is a situation that you could kick in and do it. Whereas I think fine bouting at speed, it's a bit hard to, um, to get too, you know, to get too far removed from your standard game. Um, and what I found is, what I found is the best kick is where you kick with basically heel your foot and um, your toes pointing outwards. I completely forget the name of the kick right now. Um, but the reason I want to throw this kind of kick is it doesn't, you'll notice that it doesn't stop me, it doesn't cause me to lean back near as much um, or doesn't turn me or turn my torso as you know, any kind of sidekick type thing would. I'm much, much more stable, and if I've come to an engagement, if I've, you know, I've got my opponent's weapons trapped on my own, and the best thing to do is to kick them to then to create an opening for my weapons. And the point of kicks is very much to create an opening for the weapons. This is not a there's no assumption that you would finish the fight with a kick, or you'd win the fight with a kick. Um, I can keep that weapon position, that bind, um, but control my opponent's weapons while still delivering the kick. Whereas if I have to turn, if I have to like lean back or turn, I'm going to lose that. So the kicking motion, let me show you that the way. I'll keep the weapons actually. Um, let's say I'm, I'll keep them high, but I'm just, let's assume that I'm down my opponent high. Motion is I lift up, so I come to here. I fire in and I'm kicking with the heel and then I come back. I'm not great at this, but you know, it seems to work. Um, I'm getting a lot of the power not just from lifting my knee up and basically stamping it down, but also from pushing my hips forward. So I'm kind of firing my hips forward to get a bit of a weight shift as well. Um, but I find actually even bending the knees gets a bit of a weight drop. Uh, and certainly in terms of strikes, the thing that generates, or well, the three things that generate power, one is structure, which is actually the least, is in fact the least important. A lot of, um, people often people talk about like structure, like, oh, you know, I've got this, you know, basically I've got this braced position where all of the power has to go forward because it can't go back into movement, which is important, don't get me wrong, not just having structure alone will not generate power, and you can generate power without structure, it's just a helpful thing to have. Thing two is uh, weight shifts. So I drop my weight or I shift my weight relatively forward as a way of generating power. So you'll see this in boxing punches. I can, um, like we said, trigger step, fire my weight, drop my weight forward, and that's what generates a lot of power. So it's a shift in weight. But it also goes for dropping weight. Like if I just drop straight down, uh, the transfer of weight for whatever reason, it helps me expand my limbs out and fire them out, um, just because of the way, I think just because of the way joints are aligned. So, um, but it's just an observation that people who are much more fighters than me have made that shifting weight in itself is good for power generation. And the third thing is um, the number of joints you apply. So punching with just my, um, my arms, not great, 
because all I'm really doing is using my elbow generate power. If I add a bit of shoulder wall, I'm generating more power because I've got an additional joint. If I twist my hips, I'm generating even more power um, because I'm getting more joints in helping me with that power generation. So when it comes to um, this kick, always I generate power, is I'm shifting my weight forward, but I'm also using as many joints as I can. And that means, um, and also shifting my weight down, so I'm getting a forward shift and a downward shift, so I'm getting two kinds of weight shifts, which also means I'm moving more joints, I'm using my other leg as well to drop my weight a little bit. And that's what generates um, power to then displace my opponent. Um, also, and uh, likewise, the target for the kick is the crease of the hips. I'm kicking down, basically, on what I want to aim for is the joint. So what I want to do is collapse this and basically break my opponent's structure, um, because that means, one, that it's very, very hard for them to attack whilst their structure is broken, whilst they're basically needing to recover the balance, um, which makes it, which means I've got an opening to then kick them, um, and also because if, you know, if I've got a bind here, if I'm not controlling it, and all of a sudden I shift back. You know what you were saying before about how the other kicks cause your weapons to go flying in random directions? I've used this kick to do that to my opponent. So this is really the most common kick within the system, um, because it's the only one that really makes a lot of sense. Uh, the one exception to that is more so again, pretty much entirely against Solomon and Sabre. My instantly Chambon doesn't talk about what to do if you've got an opponent who's using a scabbard in the offhand. This system is entire like is entirely asymmetric. Um, which I find really interesting because it's very uncommon you see. It's not that common that you see uh, manuals deal with um, asymmetric fighting at all. Um, like it's usually a weird addition. Like, you know, if you've got a sword, he's what to do if they have a spear kind of thing is it's not terribly common. Most manuals are. You have a sword, your opponent has a sword, here's what to do. Um, but Chen Bon is, Chen Bon does not talk about what to do if your opponent is doing basically the same thing back to you. Um, I find that kind of interesting because that seems to have been the trajectory of later sword systems. When we were looking at um, Tui last week, that was, you know, that was one of my major criticisms. I'm like, this does not seem like a sword on sword system. Um, well, I mean, Jacob did have some really good insights about how it could work as one. Um, so, you know, Maybe I was a bit off on that, maybe not. That, that's up to you. But the other kick that is helpful is I basically fire my leg on the ground and slam. It's really the, the sole of my boot. So that if you think of like a combat boot, um, particularly a period one, I might go grab in just a moment. Now, if I wasn't live, it wouldn't take me a while to find it. would go get a boot. I'll bring it out next week. So come back next week for the next lesson um, and you get to see some nice, you get to see some nice shoes. Um, but yeah, I'm driving these, um, the blade of um, the heel of the sole of my boot into my opponent's shin, um, basically using my body, my weight shift, um, as a counterweight to fire it as quickly as possible. Uh, it's the move you see in defense stands, the room angle, so like self defense of art and self defense art, self defense stuff from France from a similar period. They do this as a. Um, I do this as a kick. Um, it's a little bit, it's in some Savart manuals from the period, although there's a point where this, from what I understand, this was banned. Uh, if I'm wrong about that, just let me know. I'm not a Savart expert, but my understanding is this was actually banned in Savart um, because it is very, as much as it's a very short range attack, it's very hard to deal with. I fire, I'm basically just firing, um, firing this very, very quick, aggressive kick into my opponent's shins. Um, I like these because barefoot they don't rip, like you can do them with a good degree of speed and they're not going to really hurt. But as soon as you put on a combat boot, they become quite damaging. Um, and it's basically just moved into disrupt my opponent, allow me to then come back to guard. Um, and basically, if we're, particularly if we're close and we're pressing against each other, it can be a good way to accrue advantage. Just fire out and back. It's not. None of these are stamps. You never stamp afterwards. Um, I know that some one of the people advocate that you throw a low line kick and then follow up by like sliding down off the opponent's foot. Uh, the reason you don't do that um, in these systems is if you are you do that when you do the kick, you're going to be falling forward, 
with the weapons and weapon control is really, really bad. Uh, with um, alternatively with um, arm fighting, if you miss, if your opponent pulls their leg out of the way um, or moves, you're basically falling forward, which makes you very, very vulnerable to counter hit. Um, and this is the thing a lot of, um, I've actually seen a lot of survival advice about how to basically not fall, generate power without needing to fall forward, based on the grounds that if you fall forward on your kit, you'll throw one um, and it will miss and you'll get punched in the face and knocked out because you're basically falling forward into a punch. So yeah, these are the, those are the two kicks you see common in the system. Final thing we see is um, strikes with the scabbard, which are pretty universal. There are defenses with the scabbard, but they're very, very situation specific. Whereas the strike is basically I fire out. So I just flick, um, think of almost like a cross in boxing, twisting my hip to generate power. Um, and I just flick, flick, flick. Um, yeah, it's, very much across, like a box, um, much like a cross in boxing. Um, this is not done on the lunge, uh, just because that's free. It's very frequent, it's very awkward to get power into it as you lunge. Um, this is done more or less at, you often at the opponent's weapon, or alternatively, if your opponent has come close, has started to press in and you've had to do a very committed parry that you're not sure you could repost very quickly from with the sword, you fire out into the opponent. So, the footwork is I raise my right foot and drive, I'm actually pushing into the ground to find myself forward as well as I do this. And I'm just whipping, um, I'm basically whipping out with um, the scabbard. So, in the same way, if you're you know, playing with wet towels, with you know, whipping each other with wet towels, the fun in the locker room, um, or bathroom or where it is that you and people that you're comfortable being naked around with each other with towels. Um, you know, you think of that same motion except you're doing it really with um, something that's got quite, a, it's got a lot of weight at the end so it's quick fire and um, that is enough to generate a lot of speed and a lot of force. The other trick to it is you want to hold this loose in your hand. So if you remember before how I said um, that you bring the bottom fingers on the line to generate power and top fingers for control. With this, you deliberately fire out, throw essentially the punch with your top fingers holding control, flicking the bottom fingers on to then fire, um, and you're getting this flick. It's a very, very flicky movement to generate power, and that will generate um, a lot of power very, very quickly. It isn't to say it's the only way to generate power, um, but it is one of the most efficient. Um, you don't want to get into the habit. I see a lot of people where to generate power, they do it entirely with their hips and glutes. Um, so they'll do very big lockdown swings, which are powerful. I've been hit by them a few times and just been like, yeah, do you need to pull your shots? The problem is that they can't, they're very, very committed and they can never not be powerful. Um, like to land one makes you basically an exceptional amount of weapon control. In fact, the two, I've only had those land on me twice like where I'm just being able to counter cut someone on move. Uh, one time was the other person was had, actually was holding onto my sword. Um, and I was like, all right, they've got my sword. They've been trying to get the grapple as well for quite a while. Like they've just been really fixated on doing that for longer than it was really helpful. Um, and so I'm just like, all right, well, you finally got it. You know, good job, hit me. And they did a big locked body swing. And I was like, okay, I'm not, fen I can't, I'm going to stop fencing now because that was just a bit too hard. Um, the other time was actually, yeah, the other time someone got one of those on me was um, I was basically just being a, t a test dummy for some armor and they were doing these big lockdown swings um, and then one crash. And then because this method isn't very accurate, they also miss. So, you know, the point of all this is when you're to generate power, you actually want to relax and do a little bit of work with a lot of different joints. So when I'm firing this, quick snapping movement when I'm bringing my body behind to fire out. Um, and it's actually very, very similar to um, the tip slashes I talked about in Lacan, um, or alternatively like Lacan Vigne, um, has a similar sort of thing where you just flick. It's 
basically flicking the thing, like you're flicking a whip or a towel or something, like you're whipping as a way of generating power. Um, and yeah, that's basically all, of, that's the basics bits of Chambon. Um, so that's the basics of the system. Um, if you have any questions, just shoot them down. Um, I'll sort of, sort of round up with um, you know, some thoughts on the system in general. Um, but yeah, like I've been saying before, this is very, very much um, in development. This is a system I'm interpreting and interpreting live. Um, I was kind of motivated to do this, I think, because I've noticed a lot of Hina people are kind of regarded as experts and everyone sort of sees it as so sort of funny as coming from them as opposed to coming from really the, the place that sort of funny actually comes from, which is uh, so first and foremost, bounding and secondary uh, to that sources. Um, you know, like I, I guess my worry is I see a lot of people kind of disregarding their own experience um, to attempt to learn from experts and or like authority figures basically. And, you know, I mean, I do believe in expertise and like having a knowledge that lets you solve problems that a person without that knowledge couldn't. Um, but I don't believe in authority where having knowledge that others don't um, confers a great, you know, a greater moral weight to your character or like, you know, authority as a notion, I think is, is quite deeply problematic. Um, so yeah, if you have any feedback or any thoughts, um, if there's anything you don't think I covered well enough or anything I did wrong, do say, like, again, this is, this is very much, you know, in the, de the development stages. Um, not that that, not that you couldn't do that sort of stuff with anything else I teach, but, um, particularly now don't feel like you shouldn't, um, because yeah, like I said, this is something that I'm working, working on, working through. Um, yeah, if you um, have any questions, chuck them down. Um, or, you know, alternatively, just, um, yeah, message me, whatever. Um, it's all cool. Like, this is meant to be kind of a discourse. Um, I probably would have done this as a full-on, like, forum dialogue thing, much like I did um, with uh, the, the work we did on Bovill, um, like, last year? It was earlier. It was earlier. What, is, what even is time now? <laughs> Um, cool. So other than that, um, yeah, we'll be back next week looking at much more specific parts of the system, like looking at the bits where we're actually, um, like, you know, where we're looking at, um, how to deal with someone with armed with a bayonet, um, because that was kind of a big part of Genbond systems, it's situation specific. And then we're going to move on and look at how you deal with cavalry. Um, and then after that, we're going to look at um, how you deal with someone who's just armed with a saber. Um, so yeah, this will be a four-week thing to take us all the way up to Christmas. Um, we are going to be jumping on Zoom after this. Uh, I know we didn't last week, but we are definitely doing it this week. So, you know, if you want to come and chat or just like if you have some thoughts that you feel you need to talk through, more than welcome to um, jump, the, you know, jump in with those. Um, also, if you did enjoy these, we are, you know, and you want to sort of help us with some of the running costs, please make a donation via PayPal. Um, every little bit helps, and we are currently in the process of getting a haul for next year and actually starting physical classes again. Uh, so, yeah, right now, particularly when we've got, like, insurance overheads and, depo and haul deposits and stuff like that, um, is the time we really, you know, it's the time where we really need, you know, need your support. Um, speaking of physical classes, we are also meeting up on random days, usually a Saturday or Sunday, um, to fence in the park. With the last two Saturdays we've met in we've met consistently and we will be meeting again this Saturday, uh, just more fencing. The Saturday after that I don't know about because I won't be able to come and fence on that Saturday, so we'll have to we'll have to wait and see. Um, but yeah, certainly this Saturday come if you're um, in the general Haberfield area, the inner west, come join us. Um, I'm gonna, I might even try and test some of this stuff out, um, against a resisting opponent just to see how it goes. Um, like actually, you know, well, I've been doing a bit of testing with the scab and stuff. Um, I'd like to do some more. Um, maybe, um, although I am also working on a scab and simulator that actually has the proper weight distribution so I can properly beat stuff out of the way. 
because uh, when I was doing it, even with the sticks, I find you just can't get quite enough impetus in the strikes um, to do the sorts of things that the manual says you should. So, yeah, fun. Anyway, I will see you all next week if I don't see you on Zoom shortly.